I was supposed to tell you something about my background, but Father did already. And uh, what else? And the church in Romania, the monastic life in Romania. And to challenge some people maybe to become monastics in America too. I was born in a country that uh, has Orthodox faith since the time of St. Andrew the Apostle. Because St. Apostle Andrew, the first called by Christ, uh, preached uh, Christianity on Danube value. And St. Andrew, the tradition says that, went even far to Kiev in Russia, in today's Ukraine. When the church split in 1054, we didn't feel anything because we remained the same until today. It, uh, it is very confusing for me to live in America where supposedly we have 1,200 uh, religious groups or denomination because uh, we, in Romania, almost everybody is Orthodox. 87%, according to the last census, are Orthodox in Romania. In Greece, 90%. So we don't have these problems like here with converts. With, uh, so uh, I was born Orthodox. And what I, I don't, cannot tell you anything else but orthodoxy. So uh, what is orthodoxy? Orthodoxy means in spirituality, not in theology. Because theology is something that you can read in the books. But to understand theology, you need prayer. Because the understanding of theology comes from above. You can read one million of books. You can know the Holy Scripture by heart, and you don't understand anything. Because the understanding comes as a result of worship. Orthodoxy is a church that worships God. You know how long services we have. And don't complain about uh, the services, they are too long. A metropolitan, Philip, your metropolitan, went once in Kansas City, and there was a priest there that was making so long services that people complained to, them, to metropolitan Philip. And he went there and said, well, what's the matter with you here? You don't like the priest. Yeah, too long services, Father. And he said, why you have to get used with that because that's what we will do in heaven all the time. <laughs> so, uh, orthodoxy is to worship God. In spirituality, orthodoxy is not knowledge only. Because God is not an acquisition of our intellect. You cannot say, well, I, I understand God now. I am a theologian. I, I know the books. I Oh, I am a good orthodox. Orthodoxy is to descend in yourself and to explore the inner universe. In the Western countries, there is a tendency to know things outside of ourselves. You explore the universe. You go in outer space. And... Uh, all the knowledge is outside, outside. Orthodoxy is in reverse. To discover the inner universe, which is infinite like an atom. And then this depth in, into ourselves is God. Because God is not outside of yourself. God is not spatial or material to place him in a corner there. If you don't discover God in yourself, you don't, you will nothing, uh, 
see God anywhere. But if you have God in yourself, you see God everywhere. You see God in the eyes of a child, in, in a flower, in, in the blade of grass, in animals, everywhere, if you have God in yourself. So real orthodoxy in spirituality is to explore ourselves, to go inside. But we are afraid to go inside, because it's an awesome reality. St. Paul said, don't you know that you are the temple of the living God, that God lives within you? You say in an uh, expression, God is in our heart. It's not in this heart, in this organism. The organ that now, you know, sometimes they change it with a me mechanical device there, temporarily. Not here in this heart, in the depth of our conscience that we call it soul. In our soul is God. Our soul is eternal, is infinite. And when St. Paul said, you are the temple of the living God, we really are God-bearers and we are consecrated temples of God, set apart for Him. Western countries have to learn this lesson. Not outside of ourselves is... God is inside. But we have to, to explore the inner universe. You have to, to live God because God is life. God is not a, Christianity is not a doctrine. You became orthodox, sure. And many priests, orthodox priests, <coughs> monks, and they recommend you to read Bishop Callister books and that. Everything is okay. But if you don't make the experience of God, if you don't live God, God is not in the books. And I learned this lesson in prison, and the communists, God bless the communists, because they put the priest in prison. The priest need a little imprisonment, because it's a wonderful experience there. Uh, father said that I was in a solitary confinement for almost three years. So I was just by myself in a small cell with, surrounded by four walls at the cell. I didn't have anything to, to look. Eleven years I didn't see a pencil, a piece of paper, because uh, communist imprisonments are not like American prison with uh, television and the library and, uh, and champagne on New Year's Day. But, <laughs> no, it's a communist prison. It, uh, they want, especially the intellectual class, to be destroyed, to become beasts like animals, and they don't give them anything to read. And, but that is the mystery. Instead of becoming like animals, we became ourselves. When you are free, you are the slave of the books. So many books, I have to read all of them. You, you don't have time to be yourself because you are made out of quotations. <laughs> yeah. Where there, there is no book, there is no, nothing, nothing else. You have to go somewhere. You don't have any uh, perspective to look. At. The windows were very high, we couldn't even touch them, and it was very small. So. You have to go somewhere, and you go inside. Inside, when I say vertical plane, and inside in yourself, I don't mean to go in somewhere in a place there. In this infinite that is in the human conscience, that is our soul, is a mystery. We discovered in prison that we are a mystery. We don't know who we are. David said, what is man, Lord, that you pay so much attention to him? You made him a little less than the angels. You crowned him with glory. And what is man? We don't know. We don't know why God needed to create me, or you and me. Because God is fullness. But you wanted to have some ta some, somebody to talk with. We don't understand. God wants to talk us all the time. 
We don't pay any attention to him. And uh, it's a mystery. If we are something, we say, well, to build your personality. Our personality is Jesus Christ. He's the image of God in us. And God is like a magnet that attracts men because we have the image of God. You know what St. Paul said, that uh, uh, I live but not I. Jesus lives within me. Galatians 2.20. Jesus lives in me. So my life is not mine. We are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Holy Trinity. And the apostles said, as many as you have been baptized in Christ, you put on Christ. You become like Christ. Christ is in us, is built in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who conceived Christ in the womb of the Virgin Mary through baptism, he put Christ in us. And the child, that child is growing together with Christ. And you will become like Christ to reach that level of the mature man, as St. Paul says, to be like him. And uh, St. John in first epistle in the New Testament says, when Christ comes, we should be like him. That's a great responsibility. We say, well, Christ will come to judge us. Well, there will be no judgment, I assure you. Christ will come, we will look at you, I don't recognize myself in you. What did you do with my image? That is the judgment. We should become like him. And he is coming. If he's not coming today or tomorrow, you go to him. And uh, when we are ready to go to him, when God calls us to go to the same, leave this, this instrument of communication in the cemetery, we should be like him. That is the judgment. So, we have to make this experience to enter in ourselves to discover God within ourselves. How? <laughs> well, what to say to you, it's hard in America because here, you know, the young people want to live in noise. They make a lot of noise because they don't feel good if it is not too much noise around. It's like an escape. This so-called music, I don't know if it is music or not, it's some, some noise, some, uh, but they like it because they are afraid to stay by themselves, to be quiet one hour in one place and don't say anything. Stay there because God wants to talk to you. And they are afraid to make these experiences and an escape. They said, well, let's make noise to, 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 to be uh, as a little girl in, in the camp, I always, uh, we have a religious education camp, I always mention that there was a little girl there, uh, as a teenage, not so little, and she had two transistories, one here and one here, because there were two programs, I don't know, with the earphone, both of them full blast, and she was walking through the camp. And somebody told her, shut them off. And she said, Father, if I shut them off, I'm getting crazy. Imagine what a dramatic situation. Not to be able to be just you and Jesus Christ. If you don't say, if you don't have anything to say to him, he has something to say to you. But that is the experience. First of all, we have to, to, uh, to be at least one or two hours by ourselves there. Not only in prayer to say something to ask, give me that, give me that thought. No, this is, not this is a prayer. The prayer is to have that feeling that God is within you. That is the definition of prayer. It's not as much as you read. It's not much, uh, as many psalms you say. Prayer is when you feel that God is within you. And St. Simeon, the new theologian, you know that there are three theologians in the history of the church. St. John, the theologian, the evangelist, 
St. Gregory of Nazianz, Gregory the theologian, and St. Simeon the new theologian in the 10th century. St. Simeon the new theologian said, a man or a woman who are baptized and don't feel that God lives within them as a pregnant woman feels the presence of the babe in her womb, they are not good Christians. Imagine that. We have to feel that God is within us. And he is everything in us. As St. Paul said, my life is not mine. He lives in me. I don't live. My life is his life. So uh, we have to, to, to make this experience really to, to be good Christians. Orthodox or not orthodox. Christianity is not divided in denominations. Jesus didn't come in this world to to found a religion. He came into this world to restore the fallen man. He didn't come here to, to found Catholicism or Orthodoxy or Lutheranism or no. He came, this is a result of our sins. He came here for our salvation, for our restoration, because the image of God in us was distorted and he came here to, to uh, repair this image to, to, to bring back the image of God in ourselves. So that is Christianity. No. Living in God, you do not live in God individually. He is in church. The church was founded by Jesus Christ on the day of the Pentecost because what is the church? The church is an organism. Jesus is the head, not the Pope in Rome. Jesus is the head of the church. We all are members of the church. One is here, another. St. Paul describes very well this in Corinthians. One is a little finger, and no, no member of the church is complaining, why am I little finger and not the ear or the eye or so on. St. Paul beautiful describes this reality of the church and the secret is to find out what kind of member are you in church what is your function in church even that little boy has a function in this church in the church of God what is my my role my my, my function in this organism I am I am a member of, of the church through baptism but what what is my, my role? What should I do? And the life of this organism is the Holy Spirit being members through baptism in, in, uh, in uh, uh, members of the mystical body of Christ. That is the definition of the church. The whole epistle to Ephesians is the definition of the church. Uh, being members of the mystical body of Christ, we have the Holy Spirit in us because the life of this organism, breathing in and out of this organism that is the universal church is the Holy Spirit. Don't pay attention to those who say, well, you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Once you are baptized, you are being a member of the church. You live in the Spirit. Otherwise, we are dead members of the church. Jesus said, remain in me and I in you. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you don't remain in me and I in you, you get dry and must uh, be cut off. So, what is orthodoxy? Orthodoxy is Christianity. If you ask me, when your church was founded, I don't know what you are speaking about. Because we were in the church from the beginning. That Catholicism split from orthodoxy in the 11th century and was the Western church and Eastern church and Luther came and he he didn't like the popes in Rome, and he split. He was a monk, an Augustinian monk. And uh, he came with that uh, uh, main branch of Protestantism. Everyone is a priest. Everyone has the Holy Spirit. I, we don't need a church. We don't need uh, somebody to tell us how to interpret the scripture. We don't need this the liturgy mass. It, Nothing, blessing of the water, the house, nothing. We have the scripture and that. He thought that the scripture 
fell down from heaven. The scripture was written in church, by the church, for the church. The church is the first reality. The Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. And Jesus gave them the sacraments. All the sacraments are in, in the words of Jesus. In the, the New Testament, the church is a sacramental reality. And we cannot have a life in in the Holy Spirit, a life in God, to be deified, to be divinized without a sacramental life. But the sac sacraments are not just ordinances, as Calvin said. They are necessary for our salvation. And Luther said, okay, I, am, I have the Holy Spirit. All of you have the Holy Spirit. Don't pay attention to the clergy. And there came, she was not dead when Zwingli, Ulrich Zwingli came and said something else. And Luther even said, that is word by word, another spirit is in you. And uh, Zwingli was not dead when Calvin came with other interpretation. When you don't have a church, when you don't live in church, when you don't understand that men from the church who were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the scripture, to put down the books of the scripture. And the scripture of the New Testament didn't exist until the fourth century. There was no New Testament. During St. John Chrysostom, the canon of the New Testament was put together because there were so many Gospels, the Gospel of St. Jude, the Gospel of St. Peter, the Gospel of uh, so many epistles. Uh, they didn't know how. In the experience of the church, the Holy Fathers who wrote so many books, they never quoted the Gospel of St. Jude, the Gospel of St. Peter. They quoted John Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So the experience of the church decided which books are ins really inspired by the Holy Spirit. Because we don't study, we live in church. The experience of the church uh, make uh, the, the truth is in the experience of the church. It's something lived, it's not uh, invented and preached. So, uh, this is orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is to find Christ in ourselves. And uh, you became orthodox. Now I, I want to repeat this in Memphis and in, uh, because it's very important what I want to tell you. You didn't find orthodoxy individually. If you think that you came just by yourself in orthodoxy you are still protestant orthodoxy is a life is the life of of uh, the experience of peoples in god not of individuals first of all you came back in church and don't think that you are saved without thinking about others in an organism, as St. Paul said, if you cut your little finger, the whole organism is suffering. The same thing, salvation is communal, it's not individual. And you come in, in the Orthodox Church in America not to become Syrians, not to become Romanian, don't become Russians or Bulgarian. Be yourself American. Otherwise, God doesn't accept your experience. Because you have a tradition, you have a background that is given by God. God made me to be born in Carpathian Mountain. I cannot be other. For me, orthodoxy is the experience of Rom Romanian people in the church. We come into the church not as individual, isolated individual. We come with our families, with our nation, with our culture. Sanctify and transfigure your culture. There are many good things in this country. Be good patriots. Uh, Orthodoxy today is accused that it's chauvinistic and uh, Nazi and uh, nationalistic. It's not true. But you cannot be Orthodox without your history. If you study better St. Maximus, the confessor, it's a very difficult uh, holy father. He thinks that 
we are in a structure like in concentric circles. The first circle, the little one, is individual, which is the person, not individual. Individual is something, something isolated. The person is somebody who lives in community. And individual is included in family. Family is a church. We save our soul in church and in, in the family. The family is included in your culture, in your cultural background, and your ethnicity, so to say, in your history. And that ethnicity is, is included in another circle that is the church, universal church. And the last circle or sphere is God. If you don't develop in this structure, we don't reach God. Because doesn't, God doesn't need me, an isolated person who, who is nobody. If I come to God, I come with my family, with my history, with my identity. God wants persons. Christianity is a very personal religion. When Jesus Christ said, if you don't deny yourself, you are not worthy to follow me. If you want to follow me, deny yourself. Because if you want to save your soul, you will lose it. But if you lose your soul for me and the gospel, you will save it. This is not a double standard here. Uh, here, we are false personalities because you are not authentic personalities. To be authentic personality, be yourself. You have an identity behind you. You have a culture behind you. You have a, a country. You have a place in which God wanted you to be born. And that nation or country in which you are born has a history. You have to come into orthodoxy with the whole destiny of the American people because they have to, to find Christ and to be saved. Even if you are a minority, you can be just one person, but you come with the destiny of your people in orthodoxy. That is orthodoxy. It is the experience of people seeing God, not of isolated individuals. I don't know if you understand that. Be yourself. Be American Orthodox Church, not Syrian Orthodox Church. Don't tell that Metropolitan Philip. <laughs> but, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, it is natural that Orthodoxy in America will become American, an American Orthodox Church through you, not through me, or Metropolitan Philip. Where we are born in our countries. We have our own background, our own identity, but you have to come with your own identity and with the destiny of this country, because there is a goal that this country has to reach. If you read in the prophet Daniel chapter 10, every nation has an angel. The angel of the Egyptian people says there, the angel of the Hebrew people is Michael, the archangel and so on. Who is the angel of the American people? But well, we have to be to, to, to think about that. This nation is not just at random. It has a history. And never, never hate the religion that you came from. Always to thank God for my Baptist church, for my evangelical church that, that made me to understand orthodoxy and to come back to church. Thank God because, because you, you, the, the basics were there. And the fact that you were sincere in that denomination in which you were before, that is important because the Holy Spirit brought you home. Thank God for my Presbyterian church that made me to understand the Orthodox and pray for them. And you have to wish them to find the church. And uh, no matter how many you are, Maybe you will be a minority. You never are in, are in minority when you are the, with the truth. If you are with the truth, even if you are one, you are majority. So um, come with the whole American history and the perspective of the salvation of American people here. 
and you pray for the salvation of the American people in which you are included. So uh, we don't want you now to, to borrow things from Russia or from Romania or from, from Syria or from Greece. No. Be yourself. God wants us to be yourself. When God said, if you save your soul, you will lose it, that, there are two kinds of personalities here. One is authentic as one is a false personality. Uh, our false identity, our false personality is that we don't want to be ourselves. We, we, uh, we are something uh, according to TV or uh, we, we imitating other things here. Well, we have to, uh, this, uh, this world is a huge stage in which we perform. We don't live. We perform because we want to have an eye like that guy and we look on TV to, to wash with that, to have their hair cut and so on. No. If you want to save this false personality, you will lose the other one. You will lose the, the true personality. You lose your soul. But if you sacrifice this to lose what is false in you for the gospel and for Christ, you will save the true personality. So, uh, we have to be true, to be uh, ourselves, to have our identity, to come to God following that structure, person, family, ethnical group, church, God, these concentric spheres or circles. If we don't develop in this structure, we are not ourselves, we are not even orthodox. Well, this idea was expressed by a Greek theologian in Romania a couple of weeks ago he was uh, traveling there is Christos Yanaras he has a book, beautiful book here Freedom of Morality that I, I would like you to, to buy from St. Vlad's Press and to read it uh, Christos Yanaras is a professor of philosophy in Athens but he's a theologian and he expressed in a conference in Bucharest this idea uh, somebody asked him, what is orthodoxy? And he said, it's the experience in, of peoples in God, of nations in God, not of individual experience. We don't save ourselves only. Uh, as long as, you know, in, in organism there are some wounds. These are sins. But the vitality of the organism, the Holy Spirit, heals all these wounds and eliminates what is not worthy in, in the mystical body of Christ. But we come in this mystical body of Christ ex exactly as God has created us. And that, so I would like you not to, 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 to forget this. Uh, we want you to, to be the American Orthodox Church. We are not the American Orthodox Church. I am Romanian Orthodox Church. Uh, others are Syrian Orthodox Church. Our, Others are Greek Orthodox Church, but you, I think, you will establish the true American Orthodox Church. Until then, we will have many jurisdictions, many dioceses, and many. But our merit is that God sent us in this country to plant Orthodoxy. The Greek uh, people think that uh, they came in America to make money and to go back <laughs> and uh, business. But God had other plan with them. Look here how beautiful churches and parishes have the Greek, and they do a very good job. They brought even Frank Schaefer in, <laughs> into Orthodoxy. <laughs> well, that, that, that is something. It is something. And uh, um, we didn't come here to make money and to go back. Sure, maybe we thought this way, but God had another plan. And today you are here, so as a result of our, our coming. God bless the communists because through, from the communist world, the refugees came here and they wanted to have their own orthodoxy here. And uh, having their own orthodoxy, sure, you found the church <laughs> in them and through them. So everything in history is important, even communism, God is moving the historical event. So everything is, it's okay. Uh, I was in prison, but I'm not sorry that I was in prison. God uh, was the blessing because I became a monk in prison. I found God in prison. I was a theologian. Shame on me because I, 
I didn't understand what God is. My God was the God of the books. Even the God of the Holy Scripture is something else. The real God is life and experience. Is not the God of the books. My God, wow, I was a theologian. I was wow, reading a lot of books. I didn't know God, the real God. The real God is that. Rediscover who you are. You are the temple of the living God. You are consecrated churches of God, and God lives within you. Uh, and because I didn't want to develop my background, monks are nothing. They go to the monastery because they want to be anonymous. So why to speak about me? That's uh, useless. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, want just as information to tell you that uh, Romania has a population, the whole pop population is uh, 23 million, almost like Canada, whole Canada. And 20 million are Orthodox. And we have 400 monasteries in Romania. It's a monastic state. And how beneficial it is to have uh, monastic, uh, so many monasteries. I was raised very close to a monastery with 80 monks. In Romania today, there are monasteries with 600 nuns and 500 nuns. They have seminaries for monks and nuns. And, uh, it's a monastic state. You see monks in the marketplace, on the sidewalk, everywhere, surrounded by people, and they talk, oh, sister, I want to tell you this and that. That is it's beneficial. It's, uh, this influence for the family, for children, is wonderful. Even, we even speak in monastic vocabulary. We say, bless me, and uh, like, like the monks in the monastery, because... Uh, the monasteries gave us the first schools, printing shops, the Romanian culture, the Romanian history. In the Middle Age, the metropolitan of the country was the chief justice of the country. So we had uh, courts to judge the, the, the criminals until 18, I, nine, uh, 1866. All the the trial, we didn't have a constitution, secular constitution, holy canons. All the courts were judging according to the canons of the church. So imagine to have an orthodox history. You cannot speak in Romania about national history without orthodoxy and monasticism. You cannot do this in Russia, too. The communists could not destroy that. They repaired all the historical monuments which most of them were monasteries, because God puts the devil to work for himself. So they, the communists repaired the churches. They were historical monuments. They were a treasury of the country, but today we use them. So uh, it's very good for the family to have monastic community, to visit monasteries. In, in America, until now, we have, according to Father Hope, because 53 monastic communities, orthodox monastic communities. Go to see some of them. And uh, I know that you are striving to have a couple of monks here. It's a beautiful place for, for monastery here. It's good to have them because the children will, will see them at least with these uh, funny clothes that are on them. Well, this doesn't make the monk this. We could be without this. But anyway, when you see a sister on the street, at least you see somebody who lives for God, totally dedicated to God. What is a monk? A monk is like you. He's a, he's a, 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 a lay people. We are not clergy. Fathers are part of clergy, but the monks are not clergy. I am a clergyman because they needed in the monastery a priest. And they made me a priest, but I didn't go to the monastery to become a priest, to be a monk. So uh, the rest of the monks are like lay people with one difference. They want to live in eternity starting at this moment. If we live in eternity, why to get married to, to be involved in these limited temporary, temporary things? But this is a special vocation. Father Thomas 
Hopko says that the same calling is for monks and for everybody. We have to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, he didn't say only for the monks that. When Jesus said, if you don't deny yourself, if you don't leave your mother and fathers and daughters and for me, if you love your mother and father more, than, he didn't say that for, to the monks. He said that to everybody. We, we all are called to perfection, but there are many vocations. Some people come to perfection via family and children. It's a, it's a cross. It's a crucifixion. It's, a, it's not so comfortable. We understand that. Some have the vocation to live by themselves to be single, and we recommend to the single people to become monks or sisters. So uh, the vocations are many, but the calling is general for everybody to, to reach perfection. So monks are some people who decided to live in eternity starting in this moment. So, and uh, I don't want to, to keep you because you are tired. If anyone has some questions to ask me, please. And, uh, excuse my English, I, I, I would like you to understand me. Okay. So, any question, Father? Father, do you see an increase in interest with people that feel that the monastic calling may be part of their life? Yeah, there is a revival. In uh, Romania, after the, this revolution that abolished communism, uh, little boys and girls, though, go to the monastery. We brought some sisters from Romania, are very young, uh, very young, uh, 18, 19, uh, 20 years of age, they go to the monastery uh, in Romania. In Greece, there is a, a, a movement, intellectuals go to the monastery. Father Emilianos from, from uh, uh, the monastery of St. Peter and Paul in the Holy Mount, Athos was president of the university, Father Vasilios, who published, by the way, that hymn of entry. You have that book uh, by Father Vasilios from Stavronikita. He was professor at the university. In Greece, intellectuals, professional people leave everything and go to the monastic life. There is something that the Holy Spirit put into people today. It, there is an interest. When I came in 1972, I don't think there were six monasteries, maybe. And now we have 53. So just look here, we are, there is an, uh, an interest in orthodoxy and in monasticism, because orthodoxy without monasticism is not whole. Uh, monasticism from the beginning was in the structure of the church. Even from the Old Testament, Elijah, Elisha, John the Baptist, who is the patron of monasticism, St. Paul, St. John the theologian, and so on, Virgin Mary, and so on. Well, uh, monasticism was not organized in buildings and uh, with an abbot or igumenos were out to say, no. But they were, it was always in the structure of the church. The virgins, St. Paul said in his epistle, pastoral epistles were organized. The widows were organized. So uh, without monasticism, the church, uh, the Orthodox Church cannot have a, a, a real life. So if you want to do something, well, some of you maybe are prepared to dedicate the whole life to God. It's very good. If you, as St. Paul said, if you are not married, don't hurry to, to marry. Stay exactly as you are. And uh, he gives them advice. A married woman or man uh, want to please the wife or the, the husband, but who are not married, uh, they will please just God. And, so uh, St. Paul wants that everybody to be like him. But sure, the vocations are various vocations. If you don't have good families, you will not have monks and sisters because they don't come from heaven. So, <laughs> so and uh, educate your children in a Christian vision to be good Christians, and they know what to do with their life in the future. Don't worry. We will have monastic life here in America. We need to change the vision, to change the vision, to go inside, to explore this inner universe where God is. Thank you. Other question, please?
Thank you, Father. <laughs>